I'd love for you to join me May 19th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, where we're going to answer your questions live on how to rock retirement in this age of inflation and everything else going on, as well as talk about the open enrollment period for the Rock Retirement Club. You can learn more and register at livewithroger.com. Anyone that's ridden a bicycle on a road with a nice tailwind pushing you along knows how mighty fine that is. At least until you turn around. Well, it's the same thing for retirement, too. Welcome to the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. And this is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but have the confidence to rock retirement. And that confidence is key. Confidence is a tricky thing. And I'll admit, I'm a pretty self-confident guy, but I struggle at times with confidence. Just the other day, I was managing through a day where I just felt like I was getting beat up. But that's okay. We all have that. That's why we have protocols. Last week on the show, we answered a few questions, and I talked a little bit about options, not thinking about retirement as binary. And I think this applies whether you're preparing for retirement or you're already in retirement and perhaps floundering a little bit in terms of what you're going to do every day, or perhaps you wish you wouldn't have fully retired. Right now, we have what I call a pre-retirement tailwind. I wanted to hit on that a little bit today before we get to questions and answers. As a result of a, a lot of different factors, honestly, some of them I don't understand, the job market, COVID, remote work, there is a desperate need for people for talented people at corporations. Everyone I talk to at bigger corporations, at small companies, are dying to find somebody for their team in various roles, even big corporations. That is coinciding. So there's this big need out there for people, good people. And that coincides with a reframing of how work works in terms of remote work how often you have to be in the office. Companies are much more comfortable after COVID saying, hey, we can make this work. There are companies, I think Charles Schwab is one of them, who early on said, nope, everybody's coming in. And they quickly had to pivot and change some of this cultural rigidness and have discovered, hey, this can actually work. People can be productive and work at the house. We have a big need for quality people. We have companies more open to remote work, and perhaps you have had the taste of remote work and say, hey, I sort of like not having an hour commute every way. I like that I can manage my day in my house and, and get my work done, but still create boundaries to go do other things. Obviously, you have to do that because work could take over your life. So this is a retirement tailwind or pre-retirement tailwind, and if you are already retired and perhaps wanting some stimulation and some income for whatever, you have opportunities. Someone I know that I work with this about a year ago now was retired and they went back as a project manager of sorts for a company and created remote work that he's enjoying. Now, when he did that, he started to get back into his old rhythms and the company did too of asking too much. So he had to do a little bit of a reset on a boundary issue with the company and with himself. But it seems like he's navigated that. So even if you're retired, there are opportunities to work part-time, to work remote, to work contract. You are in a strong negotiating position, most likely. And so as you're either exploring retirement, I encourage you not to think of this as a binary thing. I quit and I'm done. Perhaps you put on training wheels and negotiate down to three days a week or 100% remote if you've gone back to the office already. And even if you're retired, if you have your network, you can start to reach out and because there might be an opportunity for you to earn some income, which might help from a security standpoint, but psychologically and quantitatively, 
and give you some stimulation and get you back in the game a little bit. This is a big tailwind right now because of the convergence of all these things happening. And that's one reason why I think I talked about a month or two ago, the book So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport, which was actually written for like people coming into the workforce, talking about building career capital by just being so good. And then that career capital you can use to spend either for promotion or for income or for time freedom. And for you, you have a lot of career capital built up. You likely have never thought of it that way. So think of that as something you could potentially use. So just some thoughts there on this pre-retirement tailwind that really puts you in the driver position to custom build a transition or some stimulating work. This show is sponsored by LTCI Partners. You can learn more about them at ltcipartners.com forward slash R-A-M. The two biggest issues I find when people are thinking about long-term care is one is, what will it cost me? And two, will I qualify? Well, the nice thing is LTCI Partners has created a quick and easy process where you can fill out a maybe a two-page questionnaire. It doesn't get too deep. And then from that, they will screen you as to whether you might qualify for long-term care insurance or not, and then send you some indications of what a traditional policy or what a high pred policy might look like in a pretty non-salesy process. So you can go to ltcipartners.com forward slash R-A-M. If you click on get quote, they'll have you fill out this little questionnaire so they can do a pre-screen from a medical perspective, very high level, and then let you know if you're likely to qualify and then give you some indications of what the cost would be for those types of insurance. So go check that out. So we're going to continue with answering your questions this month. Our first question comes from Lenny, and he wants to know how to go from being a saver to being a spender. He says, hey, Roger, without a doubt, best podcast among many. Well, thanks, Lenny. Thank you for the wealth of information you provide. My question is, how do you become comfortable with the switch to spending your savings in retirement? My wife and I are in retiring in April, which is, the, wait, that's this month. Awesome. You're 52. What? Congratulations. We spend all our working years building our nest egg, watching it increase, and I have a hard time watching it decrease as the years go by. We will be eligible for pensions at age 60, then Social Security, which we are planning on delaying. Thanks for your input. Well, that's a great question, Lenny, and whether you're 52 or 62, it's a hard transition. I think one way you can become comfortable with spending, Lenny, is just realize, hey, this is a process. It's not something that you're going to intellectually sit down, analyze, and make a decision about. This is a money script, which is the script we develop about ourselves and money way back from childhood that's we'll have to manage. We likely won't get out of it, but we can manage it. And we all have a different money script that we tell ourselves. And we'll talk about those in the future. But just realize this is going to be a process. It's not going to be a decision. And at, once you get over retirement, into retirement, that's when it's really going to be a more important decision for you, Lenny. And I think it'll be probably easier because you're going to start living this life that you're talking about. Right now, it's all conceptual, right? So it's hard to, quote unquote, look out into the future and say, I'm going to spend all this money. So I think this is going to be a process. And the way that process can work is as you and your spouse, I think you're married. Uh, I couldn't tell. So yeah, you and your wife, as you're starting to live this life in retirement, you're going to start building activities that you enjoy doing. Maybe it's pickleball, maybe it's mountain biking, maybe it's volunteering. And as you start to lean into those, you're going to start to create this new life that will you'll become comfortable with. It'll be a little weird at first. You're going to be freaked out about the money for a year or two, maybe. 
But then you're going to start to become comfortable with this and lean into it. Then you can look at them as a year by year decision as to what do I want to spend on mountain biking or on knitting or on volunteering in terms of the commitment that you make. So this will be a process. So a healthy process will be you leaning into this and slowly becoming comfortable with the new rhythm, which will build confidence if you're assuming you have the protocols of being agile and having little conversations so you and your wife can make these decisions. Because really what's going to happen, Lenny, is you're going to make your spending decisions outside of the base good life or great life, excuse me, base great life. You're going to make these decisions on a year by year basis. So every year you're going to say, what are we comfortable spending next year on that base great life and on the extras? And so don't feel like you have to predetermine this extra spending. And it's okay to moderate because markets are bad. Even if statistically it says you're going to be fine, moderating anyway really helps you feel like you are retain agency, helps you retain agency. So just walk the journey. What you don't want to get into, Lenny, is you don't want to get your grip so tight on it on, oh my goodness, we're not saving anymore and we're watching every penny and that will create really stressful conversations and zap and suck the joy out of your retirement journey. So I've seen people do that. Well, all they do is worry and they end up essentially becoming rather than an empowered person, someone that's a victim. Everything's acting upon them and they just have to hold on to it so tight because inflation and the market and life is sucking my money out and every dollar goes, I feel less and less empowered. You don't want that dynamic that sort of seeps in and I've seen that happen. I think you're going to be okay. That's one reason also, Lenny, why if you build out a structure like we walked through last month, on the fundamentals, and you pre-spend money within building the buckets or the pie cake structure, that mental accounting, which mental accounting, I just went through a a real in-depth behavioral finance course, that mental accounting is a bias. And this is one way that we can make it work for us, which is by pre-spending the money in terms of having these payroll reserves or this income floor and have it in a separate account so mentally we've pre-spent the money so we can use that mental accounting for our benefit, actually, because it's human nature. So hopefully, Lenny, that helps you think through this. Man, 52, that's exciting. You have The world is before you, and I'll question whether it's really retirement or something in between. Hmm. Something to think about. Great question, though. Our next question comes from Bob who's on the rocks about being born in 1960 and wonder if there's a big downside. Bob says, hey man, so it turns out I might have made a big mistake having been born in 1916. What was I thinking? Bob says. (laughs) What I've heard is that Social Security benefits for those born in 1960 will be dinged based on the impact of the magic Social Security calculation based on COVID hitting in 2020. How bad is it? Thanks. You rock. So, Bob, the short answer is you're fine. There's not going to be a huge cut for everybody born in 1960, but let's walk through it a little bit. The way one Social Security benefit is calculated is dependent on a number of factors. There's the years you've worked, your earnings, how old you are when you start claiming. But all of these earnings across all the years are also indexed up so that inflation doesn't erode the value of the early years of income. The indexing happens two years prior to your first year of eligibility, in other words, at age 60. So we're talking about those who turned 60 in 2020. So this is sort of what Bob's referring to. Why was turning 60 in 2020 potentially a problem? Well, in early 2020, COVID caused a huge wage downturn as the economy shut down. The market's tumbling, jobs and income were slashed across the country. The wage indexing is based on the growth of the economy. And at the beginning of 2020, the number was negative. So the early expectations of, as of like July 2020, was to see a negative, a negative 5.9% adjustment instead of the typical positive adjustment to this index that's used based on lifetime wages. And the final data, is it really known 
until late in the following year, just because it takes so much to crunch this stuff. I can't imagine the math involved. So, however, we found out in early 2021, Bob, that those early forecasts of 2020 were very far off. Markets and jobs and wages all turned around at the end of the year. And the losing the wage service jobs that were the majority of the job losses actually brought the average wage up along with strong income growth from higher income earners. So the average wage index ended up increasing by 2.8% instead of dropping by 5.9%. So your 1960 birth year, you're fine. Wages are fine. Now going forward, who knows? But a little bit of a in the weeds question. And what he's referring to is this wage index is when they look at your wage history, they index it by inflation. So the money you earned in say 19... 88 is indexed up for inflation. So you don't get dinged just based on inflation. So don't worry about it, Bob. I think you're okay. Our next question comes from Tim on a self-directed 401k. Say, hey, Roger, I'm 55 as of July. Awesome. I'm 55 too. 55 rule. And my question is, how can I access my self-directed 401k plan which earns monthly returns in real estate. Ideally, I would like to quit my job and deposit those monthly returns into our checking account instead of reinvesting back in the funds. The plan is under my real estate company and is filed each year under the 10 or 5,500EZ for the one participant plus my spouse. Thank you for advice. So essentially, It sounds like Tim's wanting to know, how can I use the rule of 55 with a solo 401k? So let's review the rule of 55. So the rule of 55 applies to someone who's retiring after they've turned 55 from a company. And if the 401k allows it, the employee can take money out of the 401k without paying the penalty, the early withdrawal penalty, which goes away at age 59 and a half. And so in this case, Tim owns his own company and he doesn't have any employees, which allows him to do something called a solo 401k, sometimes called an individual 401k, which is a very simplified 401k for solopreneurs. So the problem, Tim, is a self-directed or individual 401k can only exist while you're self-employed and still in the business, while you're still working. You cannot make penalty-free withdrawals from the 401k while you're still working. Once you quit your self-employed job, your 401k can't stay open. It either needs to be paid out as taxable income or rolled over to an IRA to preserve it. So there is no rule of 55 for an IRA or for a solo 401k. So you would have to wait until 59 and a half to access those funds without the 10% penalty. So you're going to have to think of a different strategy to help fill that gap. But I've seen this one before, so good question. Our next question is an audio question, which I love, from Bonnie regarding a universal policy. So let's, let's hear Bonnie's question. Hi, Roger. My name is Bonnie. I'm in the Seattle area thinking about retiring later this year. And I currently have a group universal life plan through my employer and I've gotten the rates on what it would cost when I retire. I'm wondering what your recommendation is to possibly keep the group universal life at a minimum amount of say 150 to be able to take advantage of the 4% guaranteed returns and maybe use that as say a vehicle to throw 10,000 a year into for a future car. Curious what you think would be the best way to approach that. Thank you. Good question, Bonnie. As you leave work, you have these group policies that you have the option. It sounds like you have a universal life insurance policy that you could potentially take on. It's difficult to say from just the information I have whether this is a good vehicle. In general, life insurance policies, other than term life insurance, are overpriced. That's a loaded term. They're more expensive because they have other quote unquote, benefits attached to them. Sometimes those benefits can be quite confusing and have any policy, since it's about $150,000 policy, there are determinations based on a policy of how much you can actually contribute based on the death benefit. 
And $150,000 policy might not be enough death benefit to allow you to put the kind of money that you're looking at putting into it. I don't, I'm definitely wouldn't be a fan of it as a fund for a car replacement as a general strategy. My suggestion, Bonnie, would be to work through and get to a plan of record. And when we get to the universal policy, create a decision tree of what are my options with this? Option A is I keep it in it and I would have to contribute this much to keep it going. And you could get forecasts on that. And you might have to get some information from whoever manages the plan so you can see the illustration of what journey you're looking on, looking at if you keep this policy. Option two is you surrender it. Option three is you keep it, but don't add to it and just let the cash value keep that insurance for you. You want to create a decision tree, and this will require you to gather some information. I would be careful with taking loans against these because that can create unintended complications later in life when you ultimately want to unwind these or potentially unwind them. It could cause you to either have to keep feeding the policy in order to keep it solvent because if the policy implodes prior to you passing, there could be a taxable consequence. So I generally am not a fan of these type of vehicles, mainly because they're more twinkyish than organic and have a lot more complication to them. But I think you want to think about it in an organized way, and hopefully that helps you. Our next question comes from, who is this from? Greg. Greg says, I have maintained a net worth for my wife and I each month for many years. Should we be including as a liability income taxes that would be due on the taxable IRA withdrawals and Roth conversions in the current and future years? If so, how would you suggest that we calculate the liability? Well, I don't know if you've seen the Retirement Plan Live series, but we use a household balance sheet within the course, within the Rock Retirement Club, where we think of these future expenses as a liability and we create a net present value of those expenses so we can look at it on not a net worth statement, but a household balance sheet, which is a little bit different. So I don't think you would do it on a net worth statement. So as an example, money that you needed to spend to pay for your life over the next 30 years, we would take those cash flows and do a net present value so we could put one number on your household balance sheet that showed the lifetime spending in today's dollars. And you could do the same with future taxes. Where we get complicated here. And taxes are just crazy. This is a big topic in the club is how do we calculate them for retirement? Because we don't know what our withdrawal strategy is going to be. So it's going to be dependent upon your withdrawal strategy, Greg. And that makes it difficult when you're building a household balance sheet. So you have to build the first balance sheet. Let's assume you knew all the numbers, Greg. You knew year by year what your tax estimate was then what you would do is put that in the household balance sheet as an expense, and then you could do a net present value of it. And that way, the taxes would be represented just like your spending during retirement, et cetera. The problem is we generally don't know what our tax liability is going to be because it's strategy dependent, meaning that if you do Roth conversions over a certain number of years, it's going to have one liability, or if you drain all your after-tax assets first, it will have another liability. It'll depend on the path that you take to do this, and that can get really confusing. And the other thing that it can lead you to, Greg, is a false sense of precision. This will lead you down a path to try to be precise of what your tax bill is going to be in 2033, and here we are in 2022, when in reality what will happen in my experience, Greg, is that you're going to do a year-by-year decision on Roth conversions, where you're going to get money. We'll know what the tax rates are. We'll know what your income is. It's going to end up being a year-by-year decision. So you want to make some basic estimates. And I think it's not too difficult to do that if you just map out how you're going to pay for life. Maybe just make an eight-year forecast, Greg, of the Roth conversions or your funding strategy. And then you could build a basic tax estimate and then put those numbers into the household balance sheet. But I wouldn't put it on the net worth statement because that's a different vehicle. So I was just thinking about this out loud as we're talking. So hopefully this helps you in your planning. Our next question comes from Charlie. 
And Charlie has a question about required minimum distributions for married couples. Charlie says, I'm 67 and I have a 401k and an IRA. My wife is 61 and has a 403b and an IRA. When I turn 72, do we have to take required minimum distributions on the total of our combined retirement accounts or just the ones with our name on them? So Charlie, required minimum distributions are individual specific. So they're not spousal. So only the retirement accounts with your name on them are the accounts that you'll have to use to calculate your required minimum distribution when you turn 72. So you have a little bit of relief there. With that, let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a little baby step that you can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock life. So in the next seven days, I want you to just marinate, noodle on the reframing of retirement is not binary. It is not working or not working. There's a whole spectrum in between. And within that spectrum, there are a lot of opportunities, more opportunities, I would say, than any time before because of this tailwind that we talked about. It could be fine. You want it to be binary. I'm leaving work. Cool. Just know that you have more options. So I just want that to sit on you because that will maybe help you think of some ways to navigate whether to have more spending or maybe retire from full-time work a year or two early. Understanding that there's a lot of in-between gives you more options to help you rock life. I did a little exercise for myself because I was refreshing my one, five, and 10-year vision, my plan for the next one, five, 10 years. And I did it for personal, spiritual, health, business. What was the other one? There's another one. Community. Community. That's a hard thing to do. I did really good at the one year. Five year was pretty clear. I had some car on the way out I could see. 10 years, I have no clue. I don't have enough vision. I want to make this vivid, though, so it is meaningful to me because what I have started doing, I have a little morning protocol that I do. Maybe I'll talk about this next week. And I want to make sure I review these every single day so they resonate with me and I can lead my day on where I want to go. But I guess my point was in this, and maybe we'll talk about that in another episode, is that sounds intimidating to start with. So one thing you could start doing it's great to do any time in life is just take a paper and say, what do I want in my life? And what do I not want in my life? That's how I started. I just made a list. What are the things I want in my life a year from now? What do I want more of? Or what do I want that's new? And then the opposite, what do I not want in my life a year from now? That's something to do. Good thing to do on Saturday morning. Hope you have a wonderful week. It's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too, but remember you're not our clients. We would not love it if you took advice from yeah, us on we the would show. Not, we would not love it if you took advice from us on the show. Realize this is helpful it's in education. Talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.